So you may be wondering how in the world could I have made a video that's, uh, well so far I'm not even finished yet on my uh, hour and 43 minutes. And the time I put this little intro in it, it's probably even more than that of course, 145 or more. I'm assuming YouTube will let me upload this thing, if not I'll have to split it in two parts maybe. But uh, this video I, I did a lot of testing and experiments with my air conditioning over the summer. So this is like a three, four month project and I've edited it all together all into one video. But I thought I'd at least do a little bit of an intro so, I can kind of, so you can kind of get a little bit of an idea of all the different stuff I'm going to talk about through, you see all these different edits, all these different snippets of videos I've combined. So let's just kind of start as I scroll through here, I'll kind of remember different things I did. I know in the intro here I was doing a test on how to confirm your TXV valve is actually working. That I did that at the beginning and I was measuring the split. Um, when I started out with this project, the most average split I was seeing was maybe like 20 degrees. Split I was measuring is when the air enters in the evaporator there at the where you, the passenger keeps their feet at that entry point versus what comes out of the vent. And I was seeing around 19 or 20 degrees. Time I got done, uh, the most I seen was like 42 degrees split. So now I've really got some good ice cold dash air coming out. Really pleased with it and. As you go through the video, you'll see what all I did to, to get to that point. Um, I talked about pressures. Uh, I show how to hook up the gauges. I talk about how pressure correlates to uh, temperature, and we explored that. Um, hooking up the gauges. I'm trying to go past here, and I was doing some different experiments, showing like when you when you turn these fans off with it running, how the temperature will spike. So, just give an example. Of how important it is to have good airflow, because um, if uh, those if that condenser gets dirty or you have an RV that doesn't have these fans and later years they took them off and then you may be suffering uh, poor air conditioning because of that. So you can add these fans if yours don't have them. Uh, they make a kit for that. Well, the Brazos have them I believe. Uh, go through all the different components and uh, show you kind of what they do, where they're located. So if you have pro problems, problems with yours, you have a chance of being able to troubleshoot it. I take the, uh, the servo all apart, show you how to take it apart, make sure it works, how to put it back on and off. It's kind of a trick to that, to get it on and off kind of easily. Uh, and I learned a lot myself by doing all this stuff, by experimenting, taking things apart. There's, I got a lot of content. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, we talked about pressures and switches and how they work, the vacuum, um, fuse locations. What else do we get here? Um, oh, the, about the fuses location with the blower speed. It's kind of weird. Our blower is controlled by two different fuses. One fuse is on the firewall. One fuse is under the dash. So that's kind of bizarre. If you go to go do some troubleshooting, you need to know about that. Um, vacuum lines, but how, how I found a vacuum leak and how I fixed it, and how I made some changes. There's a high pressure switch. I told we talked about that. Uh, there's the inlet. That's where I was measuring the air going in. This is down to where the passenger keeps their feet, and it's important. You know, not you gotta check that. Make sure it's not full of dog hair or pet hair or whatever. Uh, that it stays clean because you notice there is no filter from the factory. So if you have a pet, you might want to put a filter on it. Um, oh yeah, vent leaks. I found some uh, leaks under the dash uh, that we'll explore and how to fix all that. Um, what else we got? Oh, the air conditioner bypass. I talked about that. Oh. Uh, the, the air conditioner bypass, that's case your uh, your clutch, your compressor fails on you and locks up. Well, the brain goes out, you're stranded, you can't go nowhere. So you need to be able to switch that over by using a shoulder belt and a different pulley. And I'll send, I'll put a link to that, to that video. This here, this stuff, this air, AC in a can, this is nothing but trouble. Uh, and, and I learned it the hard way. If you don't have gauges, it's just a guessing game and you'll most likely overshoot. If you overshoot, it's going to kill your performance. So, uh, and I explained how that works. Because remember, pressure equals temperature. If you raise your pressure too high, your pressure goes up with it. And that's why I'm pointing that out with with my pen there. Oh, uh, what else we got here? Oh yeah, we was, I was having problems with the um, the evaporator being loose in the firewall. While I was showing the air leaks under there, and I finally got that the air leaks all sealed up, and the looseness of that air box. So I'm doing some insulation experiments. Uh, there's my temperature thing. Where are we at here? 
a little bit further. There's something else I wanted to point out to you if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Getting close anyway. Is um, I finally figured out a way to tighten up that box. There it is. I had to drill a hole because no matter what I did, I, the the evaporator was always loose. I was always losing air. So I found a way to drill a hole and put my hand up in there and, and finally get that tightened up. And I think that was another big factor also. Yeah, there's a special washer I cut made made that work. What else we got? Uh, fan motor top. Oh, there's that insulation stuff I got where I insulated the evaporator box completely to keep the cold air in. Because remember that plastic is only like one eighth thickness and that's temperature gun on the side of this box would get like 145, 150 degrees. And uh, that insulation really made a big difference. And I, I show how to do that. There's my bypass I did uh, on this vent because it's always open, sucking hot air constantly. So I did a bypass. So we now we're always in recirculation mode because by default, uh, like during the winter, winter time, say it's 10 degrees outside, you turn the heat on. By default, the air you, we had no, at least on the, uh, this style, there is no recirculation option. So it takes 10 degree air, pulls it up through, tries to warm it up and to keep you warm. But I did a bypass so that it's always in re re recirculation mode because I never really care if I have outside air or not. Show how to do that. What else that would go through? Okay, just pressure. Oh yeah, I while I was driving down the road, I hooked the gauges up as we was driving to so give you some real world numbers as you're driving down the road. And talk about the insulation thing. Oh, I found a problem with the um I found this my suction line was rubbing on the computer uh connectors to the transmission computer. I didn't like that. I rerouted some of that, got that fixed. You'll find out about that and relays, oh, how to test the compressor, uh, troubleshooting that, all the different things that could go bad to keep your compressor from coming on. There's a lot of different components you have to test, uh, vacuum lines, bypass and plugging them off. So there's a lot of content here. So that's just a little intro. So I'm going to finish getting this all edited, uploaded, so you can enjoy. Alrighty, on with the show. Okay, this is going to be a quick TXV valve test. Uh, at the moment, my blower is on low. Can you see my, what my pressures are? Let me get up here close. So about 36 PSI on the low side. Now, the high side, about 265 maybe. So now I'm going to go into the RV and open the, uh, the fan wide open. And it's, it, it should we should see a pressure temperature that would indicate our TXV valve is working and doing its job. Okay, I'm inside the RV. Now you're gonna see this incredible split that you normally are not gonna see. 66 degrees is coming out of the vent right here. That's my sensor's going. My other sensor I got going underneath the footwell here where the air intake. So when you're on, when you're on max air, when you're, when you're on max air, remember we're drawing air from an, underneath the footwell here. Um, well, when you go regular AC, you're drawing in outside air. So we're on max air. You see I'm on the, on the lowest setting. That's why I'm getting this tremendous split right now from 65 to 92 degrees. The only reason I'm getting that big split is because the air is moving so slow across the coil. So I'm gonna open it up wide open and you'll watch the temperature increase. And then we'll go outside and see if the, t uh, if the pressures change. That should indicate our TXV valve is operating, moving like it's supposed to. See how quick it's climbing. Remember we got 92 degree air is going in across that coil. And our, and our output temperature is climbing very quick. And we started at 66. Try to see where it's going to level off at. Yeah, if, I could, if it stayed 20 degrees, I'd be happy. I don't know if it, don't think it will. Because remember, I'm sitting here idling. I'm not driving down the road. All right, let's go see what the, if the pressures are changing. Looks like we're going to settle in right about up there, 74 to 93. All right, 
Let's go back out front. Uh, you see, we went from 38 PSI up to about 41, a little over 40. As you can tell, the TXV valve is working. All right, now earlier today, it was like 90 degrees, 100% less, maybe 80% humidity, something like that. Now, it's one o'clock in the morning, 75 degrees. I just checked, it's 100% humidity. And, but you can see my split, is, my temperatures are better. See the, down here at the footwell, the intake, the air is coming in at 82 degrees. And, but my vent temperature is 64. I'm still about an 18 degree split. That's, that part's about the same. And I'll show you my pressures now. Okay, so here's my pressures now. Remember, our, remember pressure equals temperature. We're close here. Hopefully you can hear me over the engine. So our R134A, we're, that's our temperature. Well, we're about 38 degrees on the coil, about 35 PSI. Now, if you'll notice, my head pressure is 250. And surprisingly, my fans are not on. I thought they usually kick on around 225. I just got a little bit. But, oh, hang on a second. I know what's not. I know why it's not on. Because I pulled the relay. I was doing some experimentation. Because it wasn't come on, coming on a while ago. I got my little switch here. See the fans are on. All right, let me put the relay in. Because when I first came out here, I was letting it run, and I noticed my um, my fans wasn't kicking on. Okay, now they're coming on. Because when I first started this test, my pressure, my high side was probably around 200. And I, I just wanted to play with that to, to force the air on and maybe get a little bit better performance. But now that uh, it's been running for a while, it's, it's kicked in and it's doing its job. So I'm just playing around, experimenting, playing with pressures, trying to find the sweet spot. Trying to find the, the best setting I can. Okay, so let me show you the difference dropping the speed down a little bit. So instead of on high, I dropped it down one notch. And you can see now we're getting about a 20 degree split. So if you slow the air down just a little bit, you'll get much colder air. You won't be turning it over near as quick, but it will be colder. And of course, remember, I'm sitting here idling in the, in the garage. Because I got my got my exhaust uh, pushed uh, piped outside, so there's no harm in that. But if I was driving on the road, I suspect I'd get uh, better numbers because because uh, the air movement is, is critical. That keeping that air moving is critical on that condenser to keep those temperatures down. Okay, another experiment. Just now look at the high side and look at its temperature. Remember our, our blue ring is our temperature. What am I looking at? Uh, get my eyeballs focused. So we're about 150 degrees. So that means this line here is 150 degrees. You barely can't touch this to high. And you also can see my low side is higher too. I'm up to 40 degrees. The reason it's, it's increased is because I pulled the relay. I shut the fans off on purpose just to show how important it is that we have good airflow. So I'm going to put the relay back in and these numbers should drop back down. See how quickly that drops? And see how important airflow is? That's amazing how that drops that temperature that quick. Of course, both of them are dropping. But I'll say, what, where we was at before? At 150. This dropped it within just a few seconds, that temperature dropped fast. Okay, so I turned that engine off so you can hear me a little bit better. Also keep in mind, I don't know if it's maybe 2007, 2008, thereabouts, or of course in their wisdom, we've moved these two fans. Uh, so 
you can see where you're probably taking a performance hit if you don't have those fans. Now, if you travel up north all the time, maybe no big deal, but if you, if you travel in hot weather, uh, you might want to investigate that. They Workhorse did later on, I guess they realized their mistake. They came out with a kit. I don't know if it's still available or not, but uh, I've seen it on the on Brazel's website where there's a kit you can buy the, the fans and everything. I think the wiring's still there. Um, but then you could probably, if, you, if you're creative, you could probably put in your own fans too if you could make you some brackets and all. But uh, that's just something to think about. If you got the, a later model and you're not getting very good performance and your electric fans aren't, aren't installed from the factory, something you might want to do a little upgrade and get you some better air conditioning. All right, today's little project is we're going to talk about workhorse air conditioning. What you're looking at here is the air conditioner on a Workhorse W24 uh, 2005 Winnebago 38J floor plan model. Uh, but this is the evaporator box you see here. And I thought about, before I start this, we'll talk about all the individual components that we have. Uh, I've had this thing for 11 years now and I've had to repair several pieces on it. So I understand a little bit about it, but I thought I would point out different components, problems to look for. So if yours is acting, acting up, you have a chance of fixing it yourself. So let's talk about some individual components here, uh, like, uh, well, the farthest one back here. This is a little resistor pack, and you can see all these different little the cold springs. That gives us our different speeds on the blower motor. Each wire gives a different resistance, making the blower run faster or slower. Also, there's a thermal fuse, so if it, it gets too hot, it will pop this thermal fuse before it starts melting the box. So if your blower is not working, then this could be the problem right here. Pardon the loud bird going by. So that's something, and I'm trying to remember, if that fuse pops, you might just, I don't know if you just lose high speed, low speed, or what you, you might lose all your low speeds. So maybe all you would have is high speed. So if that's the scenario, if you only had high speed and no low speeds, this could be the culprit right here. And mine has never failed, but I'm just thinking in my mind that may, that could be the most likely scenario. That's one component that, that keeps up with your fan speeds. All right, this component here, this is the relay for your blower. You can notice as soon as I plug it up, the blower kicks on. All right, this component is your thermostat. You can see it's got a capillary tube that runs down and under and attaches to the evaporator core. And so what its job is, it's looking, it's sensing the temperature. If it sees that evaporator core hit 32 degrees, it's no, it knows it's about to turn into a block of ice. So at that time, it will open up the connection and break the connection to the compressor. So at that, that time, the compressor will turn off, allowing the, the evaporator to warm back up and melt off any ice. And then once it gets above 35 degrees or whatever, then it will close again, the compressor will come back on. Uh, that could happen like if you had an air restriction possibility if the coil was really dirty. Something I'll show you on the inside because remember these things don't have a filter. If you have pits you got to be mindful of pits get down around the footwell and laying there all that hair is going to be pulled right into the evaporator. So you want to watch that. Okay what other components we got here? We got here this is a little servo motor that can, controls the blend door. So our blend door that you know gives us our temperature changes from hot cold and I got a little breakdown here shows you a little bit about it. So here's the box. There's a the blend door. There's a little servo motor. There's a, there's a resistor pack. There's that little thermostat I was talking about. So I'm not giving up their idea on how it works. Cause see, here's our evaporator core. That's where we produce cold from. Then up here's the heater core. So you see they're both in the same box. So it's critical that we know that this door is closed completely. Cause if that servo motor goes bad and keeps that door propped open partially, you're gonna you're gonna be mixing hot with cold if you're during the summertime. That's not a good idea because that will affect your cooling greatly. So I've already taken the this only held in place by two little screws like that. So, whoops! So let me take the take this off here. You can hear the you can hear the door in there rattling. Now get it, get it loose. There it goes. All right. Now you can hear it. I'm gonna have to get me a pair. Fire scripts on it, hang on. Okay, so I put me a little socket on here so I can rotate it. I know my, my blend door is moving. And if you listen, if you're when you uh, if you're inside the RV and you operate your hot and cold, if you listen closely, you can hear it close. 
So that's just something you want to confirm. Make sure that this is all the way closed, separating the hot from the cold. And then you can see the, where's the servo motor here? And you can see the little motor, the little plastic piece here that rotates. Now it can be kind of tricky getting back on there. Sometimes you have to, you have to kind of wiggle it just right. So it's, it's going to take two hands to get that back in place. Oh, and another way you can test this is have someone inside with the key on rotate the, the hot and cold knob and you'll, wa you'll watch this rotate at the same time. That way you know your servo motor is, is doing its job. Okay, a little bit more about this servo motor because you notice it comes on and off real easy for me. But initially it didn't and I, and I figured out why and I'm going to show you what I learned. So put it back on. Let me go inside. I'm going to show you where the sweet spot is. Uh, so you can learn from my mistake. All right, the sweet spot for removing the servo motor, at least for mine anyways, is about three o'clock position. I'm gonna give you an example. Say for instance, let's put it over to the cold position. Now let's go back out there. Okay, so you got, it's in the cold position. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove it. See, see, as soon as I removed it, the uh, dampener door fell down into the warm position because by default, that's where it wants to be. You know, it's gravity just make, makes it fall down there. So then if you try to put it back in there, you're gonna be out of time. So you want to make sure, so I, I had to play with it a little bit. I was making me some notes. Okay, sorry about that, got a phone call, got me distracted. So where was that? I was talking about how, how the servo motor goes on there and you got to, don't wanna be out of time. And I was also gonna point out the damper because by default, with gravity, it, it falls into the heat position. When you put it in the cold position, it rotates up and seals off. There, there's an opening, of course, between the heater core and the evaporator section of the box. And I'll show you here with this schematic. So here's our, our little door. So right now, by default, we're in the warm position. And when I ro rotate that up, it's, it goes up and then seals off the, between the two. All right, so now I'm gonna show you this, the sweet spot you wanna put it in, because like right now, if I put the servo back on there, I'm gonna be out of time. It's not gonna work right at all. So let me go back in and show you where we wanna put it. So we put this back on, of course, key on. I got, you, you hear the blower motors, it's on low speed. But if you put this to about three o'clock position, because if you go all the way, it's gonna be, it's gonna put the, um, it, it would put it in a bind again. Because remember, that, that servo motor is gonna close it either all the way open or all the way closed. So if you back up just a little bit, it's about three o'clock, it should just line up and go right back on there. Oh, and like I mentioned before, you know, you have, if you want to make sure your servo motor is working, just put your mark on there and have someone turn that dial inside, make sure it rotates. So now that I've got it in three o'clock position, it should just slide right on there. Easy peasy. There it goes. And it just held in with two screws. So. And then you'll notice when you go all the way hot or all the way cold, this motor will put itself in a bind because it'll be going full stroke. So anyway, that's all about the servo motor. Let's go on to something else. Okay, now here's another problem we need to address. Is these boxes are only held in with three screws. And even though all, they're all three are tight, I still get some movement and I'm losing air. When I put that blower on high, I can, you can hear the air change when I push and pull it. So I need to come up with something. I think I got an idea of maybe come up with a metal plate from here to these two screws, you know, to rest against it, to kind of push against it and hold it in place. So I need to come up with a plan. I ain't got that figured out yet, but I will. But that's something to check yours out. If you uh, put your blower motor on high and reach back here, see if you feel any cold air blowing out between the um, between the air box here and, and the firewall. I'm still getting a little, little bit of air movement and I don't like that. What else we got in here? Okay, components wise, we got a TXV valve right here. Let's see why it's the same thing. Cause this one's, there's different styles. I've seen there's two different styles on the workhorse. Uh, one TXV valve, it only works on the suction line. This, this style works on both the suction and high side line on, on both. And um, I'll show you how, how to test that. The proper way to, one way to test these to see if they're working is, of course, as long as you've got a good set of gauges, you, you monitor your low side pressure. 
uh, you just turn your blower on high, watch your PSI, and then, sorry about that, got another phone call, and then put it on low, and you should notice the PSI pressure will drop about three or four PSI. If it does that between high and low on the fan, then you know the TXV valve is reacting to the, the heat load on the uh, evaporator. So at least that way you know your TXV valve is doing its job. All right, let's talk about some more components. Of course, I think I mentioned this is the, the low side. Well, let me show you where the high side is. I have people call me sometimes because they can't find the high side connection. They can easily find the low side. And the high side connection is tucked up under here. Sometimes it's in behind that rubber flap so they don't see it. But right there is your high side connection if you want to hook up your gauges. Just FYI. And also, this is our low, low side pressure switch. And you can see here by the, by the book, it, if, it, if your PSI falls below 5.5 PSI, then it will break the connection to the air conditioning compressor. So if your compressor will not, will not come on, that is a possibility. There's several things could cause that because you could have a bad compressor, a bad clutch. I mean, you could have this, this thermostat switch could be bad. The low side switch could be bad. Uh, and even on the back of the compressor, there's a high side switch that could be bad. So there's several scenarios that you have to troubleshoot to, to make sure of. So with, with this switch, if you, you know, if you have a bad leak and you're low on Freon or refrigerant, if you fall below 5.5 PSI on the line set here on, on the low side, then it will break that connection and the compressor will not come on. That's why I've seen sometimes people when they go, if they have a completely empty system and they go to charge it for the first time, you know, you, you got to put enough refrigerant in there to get at least 5.5 PSI for it to engage. I've sometimes heard people have to jumper this switch in order to get the compressor to come on initially to get the suction going and, you know, again, get the Freon drawn in. Don't know how common that is. I've just heard people mention that to me in the past. Um, of course, here's our, our valve that opens and closes, allows the, the engine coolant to go through the, um, the heater core because of heat and sometimes these can leak all right what other components we another we got another switch down here let me see if i can get my flash get my light on it uh, okay there it is you barely can see it i think try to zoom in there she goes all right so that, now that there that's our that's our high side switch on the on the that screws into the dryer that's our dryer right there and it screws on top and that's a switch and that it turns on our um, turns on our fans. That's what that switch will do. Once it hits, I think it's 225. Let me look at my notes. Okay, I found my notes. So yeah, the uh, the switch there it's on the dryer. So when it hits 235 psi, it says plus or minus 30 psi. So it's got quite a bit of a swing to it. At that point, it will. Oh, drop my phone. At that point, it will engage our fans here. It turns them on. Get a little focus. There we go. So that's what engages those. Of course, also what what engages those is our relays. Let's see, let me see which relay that is. I believe it's this one right here. Let me confirm. Uh, nope, I was wrong. Here's my printout. It's auxiliary fan. All right. So this relay here is what turns on our fans. Of course, if you've seen my previous video, I keep this cool little switch here for testing purposes. So you're going there. Turns them on. So this switch can be handy for you. Uh, and I've got a video from probably last year. I've got the part number and everything on there about it. And uh, with it, if you had a scenario where you're, maybe your fan clutch is starting to go out on you and uh, you're starting to overheat, uh, one way to, to help with the cooling is forcing those fans on. Now, I'll, another way these fans come on is by the computer. If the engine temp hits 221 degrees, then the computer will automatically turn these fans on. But maybe it's maybe you're not getting that hot, but you're still struggling to keep the engine cool. You always run to maybe 210, 215, and you and that that can be a symptom of a bad fan clutch. Once you hit about 70,000 miles, it's about time to get a new fan clutch. Because you'll notice instead of your, you know, instead of the fan clutch kicking in about 201 or 205, the fan clutch may not kick in 
you, you, you hear that loud roar from the fan clutch. You may not be hearing it till 2.15 or 2.20. Of course, once again, you need that uh, digital readout to know what your true temperature is. You can't rely on that stupid analog gauge on a, on a dash cluster. That's why I preach the, about getting the scan gauge three. If you get that scan gauge three, you know exactly what your engine temperature is digitally. So if you see that you're always running more than 210 consistently, it's time for a fan clutch or you got to clean your radiators out or, or, or something like that. So that's an important thing to, to keep mindful of. But this can help you. And if in a pinch you didn't have this switch, there's other ways you can do it. You, you could also, by that connector I showed you down in here that's on top of the dryer, if you unplug that connector and jumper it, it will force the fans on. So you can force the fans on even without the air conditioning on. So if you need to, you're in a pinch and you've got to try to get back home and keep your temperatures down, that's something you, you can do. But if you have this little device here, you just plug it, plug it up and flip it on. Really handy tool to have. Just kind of tuck it in there and put this relay back in. And if you happen to have a bad, if you happen to have a relay go bad, there's these three of the same. You got your, so your fan clutch relay, air conditioning clutch relay, and your start relay. I may have the order wrong, but they're all the same relay. So in a pinch, you could swap one for another, you know, get you, get you going. Okay, so while we're talking about these fans here, I think in about 2007, 2008, Workhorse in their wisdom decided to remove these fans. And I think then they realized their mistake because a year or so later, then they came out with a kit, you could put the fans back on. So if you happen to have, own a, maybe a 2008 or later four-course chassis and you don't have these electric fans and you travel a lot in the summertime and you have poor air conditioning performance, you might look into get, get this kit and get those fans installed and that will help your air conditioner greatly. Um, and another thing is, you know, because it's very important getting rid of the heat because, you know, the job of these fans and this condenser is to get rid of the heat, the heat that's pulled out of the cab. It has to be removed from this condenser. You got to remove that heat before the refrigerant goes right, right back into the evaporator again. But if you don't, can't get rid of that heat, you're not going to get very good performance. Uh, as a side note, let me take you outside because I'm, I'm going to show you in a real world situation how I realized how important it is. Okay, so I've stepped outside. This is my old 1995 Nissan pickup truck. That's probably got 110, 120,000 miles on it. Great old truck, but ever since I had it, when I bought it, it only had maybe 20,000 miles on it. It's a pretty nice truck when I got it. Uh, but it never had good air conditioning. Uh, and after experimenting over the years, I, I realized it was a wreck and rebuild truck. It was totaled. And during the total process, they were putting it back together. I believe they, they replaced the condenser with an aftermarket condenser. So it wasn't as large as maybe the factory condenser. So it never did perform very well. But the way I fixed it sort of to get better performance, because I noticed while I was driving down the road 55, 60 miles an hour, I had decent cold air. But as soon as I stopped at a stoplight, the air became warm, even though it had plenty of uh, the correct amount of, of Freon in it. So I got to thinking it because it, it had a fan clutch in it like we have. We have. So I got to think, well, what if I made a direct drive out of it? Because I was just experimenting. So I took this clutch off, and you can see down there I got two bolts. So I drilled through it, so I made it a direct drive. Now, when I'm going down the road, it sounds like a jet, but it's pulling tr a tremendous amount of air through that condenser. And now I finally have ice cold air. So the whole time I was fighting this thing for years, trying to get cold air out of it, it was it was just due to the fact I, it couldn't pull enough air. So now that I've made that direct drive and it pulls plenty of air, now I'm not suggesting to do that with your workhorse. It'd kill you in fuel economy, and it probably kills me in fuel economy on this thing too, but I don't drive it that much. But uh, now I can sit and idle and have ice cold air. It blows out about 40 degree air all the time. So that, that made a believer out of me on, on how important it is getting that airflow across that condenser and getting rid, of, getting, getting rid of that heat. That is critical. Okay, here's something else I learned. It took a while to figure out is our blower motor. Our blower motor is controlled by two different fuses and that tripped me up to figure this out. So one fuse is a fuse out here that controls the high speed only. There's a fuse inside that controls all the all the other speeds besides high. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. And, and even here, even in the schematic, it says, well, let me show you here. That's the wrong one. Where's my bulb cover? According to my schematic, the, see it says 30 amp blower, but I put an X on that because that's not true. Actually, my blower is controlled by the 
the 30 amp fuse below it. But I think I see what happened from that, some, that after out here looking, because in that box it tells you 30 amp auxiliary A, 30 amp auxiliary B. So these are auxiliary connections. So I believe what had happened from the factory, they have just connected, I believe, this wire here to B terminal instead of A terminal. So you can check yours. Anyway, one of these 30 amp fuses is going to control your blower motor, but only on high. So let me show you the fuse that controls the um, other speeds. Okay, I'm back inside. Now, I pulled that large 30 amp fuse from outside on a firewall. Now, the other fuse that controls everything else is this 30 amp here. So I've got it, I got it labeled here, blower, not, not high speed. It controls all the other speeds. So you can see we're in high speed, but we've got no, no, no fan at all. Turn it back one notch, it works. But now, if we pull this fuse, we lose it. So if you're troubleshooting your blower motor, you got two fuses to check. So keep that in mind. Kind of kind of bizarre. But that's the way it is. So I labeled it because sometimes, you know, who knows, it could be this one, could be that one, but that's what it is on, on ours. Okay, another problem I've had years ago, something to keep be mindful of is your vacuum bulb. You want to make sure this vacuum line's on are good and tight. Because this, this vacuum line comes straight off the vacuum port on the back of the engine. So then you got the line here that goes back through the firewall and feeds your vacuum controls there at the dash. That open, open and closes all the diaphragm operated uh, servos. That open and closes all the different dampeners. Now something happened to me many years ago. And you can see here in this line somewhere. Yeah, you see that little split right there? That's why I had to put a coupler and put it back together. Because over the years, this was laying back here and rubbing on a sharp piece of metal or something, and it finally wore a hole in itself. And so and how I discovered that is I'd be driving down the road. Whenever I came up to a hill, I noticed the air on the dash, instead of air blowing out from the top, the air while I'm back would move down to my feet. And then after I got over top of the hill and got sort of going down the hill, then the air would re return. So I knew it was a vacuum problem, because remember when you're, when you're more wide open throttle, when the engine is heavy, has a heavier load on it you pour you pull more vacuum and it couldn't get the vacuum it needed because that vacuum line was leaking so i came out here and found it passed it and took care of it that's another critical thing i'll talk about uh I like to have the scan gauge three to monitor our fuel trims because remember any unmetered air into this engine is a bad thing because that could cause us cause us to run lean and damage the engine due to uh, pre-ignition so Always keep an eye on your vacuum lines. We want to make sure they're in good shape. All right, let's talk about some components inside. So, okay, of course, here we've got our air conditioning compressor, clutch up front. Now, I changed this out, I don't know, seven years ago, maybe. I think I only had maybe about 40,000 miles. And my failure was a little bit different from most. I was noticed I was getting a weird vibration. I noticed when I get like about 55 miles an hour, a vibration would start occurring. I, I could feel it in my feet. And I, I finally did some troubleshooting and I noticed the second I turned the air conditioner off, the vibration would go away. But it was kind of weird. It wouldn't start vibrating until I got to a certain speed. And once it started vibrating, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stop until I turned, that, turned the AC off. So I got a new compressor, took care of the vibration. That, that was no problem. But uh, the one problem I ran into was fixing the takeoff on the trip. And like the next day, I got the, I got the air conditioner. That's before I had any tools and stuff to do it myself. So I went to a local place and... Uh, they pulled a vacuum for me, went to put refrigerant in it, and that we had a leak. It wouldn't, it wouldn't pull down a hard vacuum. And we just discovered, for whatever reason, the, um, this pressure switch, it was, it was leaking around this pressure switch. Because the new compressor comes with a plug. You take the plug out, you put your old switch back in it. Well, it was, it was leaking. So we opted just to remove it so I could get on the road the next day. So this is my old switch, and I've got a new one in my shopping cart, so I'm going to... That'll be a project for another day. I'll have to, you know, pull all the refrigerant out, pull a vacuum, put a new switch in it, and do all that stuff. So that'll make for an interesting video later. But anyway, that's why it's not there. Yours, yours will have that. This, this is your high pressure switch that cuts it off. Now this switch, the way it operates, when it gets, um, when it hits 410 to, to 450 psi, this switch will break the connection to the compressor. And so, so if you in th th that case, that happens if you get it overcharged, or maybe if the condenser is really dirty. 
but most of the time people overcharge them and something else that will happen is okay you see that little piece right here you know it looks a little bit different because normally it's got like a little white piece of uh, plastic over it and the reason mine doesn't is because it blew off because being the dummy that I am I made a mistake of trying to charge it up with that Freon in a can and you put that in there and you really don't know how much is enough without gauges and of course I overcharged it and the scenario was I put some in there you know, trying to get colder air you know and we took off we, had, we just we drove about 10 miles it's like a 95 degree day we, we pulled into a gas station so as soon as we pulled into the gas station of course you know we, we dropped down to the idle then all the temperature spiked and the pressure spiked and all of a sudden this big I heard a pop and a, pss, and a fog blew out from underneath the engine and what it was that that thing had popped off so that thing had who knows maybe close to 500 psi i don't really know the spec on those pop-off valves but it was it had I, i'm overcharged it a bunch evidently so uh so don't be a dummy like me and overcharge your system with those cans of stuff it's it's very easily done so um that's what the, that's what those two things do so i need to put that back on there later on but anyway that's that ouch Another thing I want to point out while we're inside is our intake. Because right here, for air conditioning and heat also, the air is drawn through here. When you're on max air, let me turn it on max. Hang on a second. Okay, I'm going to reach over and hit here and hit the max button on the air conditioner and see if that door don't open up. I'm going to have to start the engine. i got no vacuum. Let's start the engine up. Okay, so when you're on max, max air, that opens up. And let's see if we can get in there and see real good. All right, so there is our coils to the evaporator. So mine are nice and clean, but you also notice there is no filter here. And if you happen to have pets, kitty cats, puppy dogs, if they like to get down over here, feel the air blow across them. You may have a bunch of hair in there you don't need. And if you, you pull on that plastic grill, you can pop it right out. And you can get in there and give it a good cleaning. But it probably, if you have pets, it's probably a good idea to get you some of that uh, filter material. Like you put in like a window unit air conditioner and lay in front of this to help keep the doggy hair out of it. Might be a good idea. Of course, usually when you're doing air conditioning, you just about always want to be max air. Because you, if you put this thing on regular, on vent, you draw on that inside air, it'll burn you, burn you up. Oh, it's a tight spot. Uh, what I'm talking about is right here. So that's max. But if you go normal AC, you hear it squeaking, that door will close back. And then it starts drawing the air out from underneath the RV. And it may work if you're driving down the road, but if you'll notice you stop at a stoplight, your air conditioning will just die because it starts just drawing that super hot engine heat up through that vent. So if you're trying to stay cool, always be on max air. The only time you might want AC, like if, if your maybe if you have a, if your windows are fogging up, possibly, and you need might need outside air for that. That might be a possibility, but have, I haven't really had that issue. Sometimes you have to do that with regular cars. So in my quest for colder air, I started digging around here looking for air leaks, and I I found several. Let me get a light going on here. All right, because you can see this big gap here, I can feel air being drawn around through that, but blowing out. Back in here, you can see there's a big gap. See that big gap right there? There it is. I'm losing a lot of air right through there when I turn that thing on. Air is blowing all out under the dash instead of coming out the vents. So there's a couple of problems I need to address to try to get sealed up better. And remember I said there's only a couple of screws that hold all that to this, I guess you call this a firewall. If you may have noticed also from the inside I had, well, some of this stuff here where I, that shiny stuff, you know, I put that under the, on the doghouse. I made a video on that. And I also did it under the wheel wells. But, you know, you got this, this tin. It might, if I got some left over, I think I do. I might put it in here. That'd probably help with that outside noise, help, help deaden that sound. Anything like that may, may help with the road noise. So I need to come up with something try to seal this up a little, little bit better so i can get better, better airflow 
And of course, there's your blower motor right down there. I did a video, video on it, I think last year I showed to remove it. And they're starting to fail. I've seen people, you know, about you know, 70, 80,000 miles, talk to people where the motors are going out. So I went ahead and took mine out and uh, drilled a hole in the back of it here. See a little bit of hole there. And I oiled the bearing, oiled, oiled both bearings really good. So hopefully I'll get another 15, 18 years out of it now that I got it oiled up good. But if you don't stop and oil yours, your motor's probably going to crap out here in the next few years. And they're 120, 150 bucks, I think. So that's something else you can do in your spare time. So after I made my video, I realized I didn't show you how I gained access to my vent and to my blower motor. It's real easy if you got one of these desks that pulls out. You just got four screws there, and you set up those large washers where the plastic starts to degrade and crack around those screws. But just take those four screws, and this entire desk will lift out, and it creates a nice big hole that you can gain access to the blower motor, your duct work, and check everything, make sure everything's sealed good and tight. And you might notice my suction line. I insulated my suction, suction line, uh, thinking it helps. I don't know if it does or not, but I have seen other vehicles where they insulate the suction line under the hood to help keep all that heat off of it. So I figured it wouldn't hurt, hurt anything, so I insulated that. It's just that, you know, it's just split, kind of, it's got that, you bite it at Lowe's. It's got that sticky stuff in the middle. You push it together, and that's worked out pretty well. I did that many, many moons ago. Okay, I guess I should mention this air conditioning bypass kit, which I made a video on it several years ago. I, I showed how, how to install it. Because what this does for you, if you're driving, remember we only got one belt that does everything. So if you're going down the road and your air conditioning clutch decides to fail and locks up, uh, then you're not going anywhere till you get another air conditioner or another clutch or another air conditioner compressor i should say so in that situation if you get this belt and this idler here you can uh, bypass it of course watch my video sh shows you step by step how to do it and that way you can get yourself on, on down the road until you can get to a campground and get a compression stuff put back on there but uh, that's just one more thing you can have on board with you to keep you from being stranded you don't want to be stranded. Okay, let's talk about this crazy stuff here. AC Pro or Freon in a can. I know what people think. They say, okay, um, they say, okay, the, the RV is not performing well for the air conditioner. They buy a can of this stuff and it's maybe it's 12 ounces and they think, well, you know, they, how much am I going to put in there? I said, well, I want some super cold air. I'm going to put the whole can in it. Or better yet, I'm going to put two cans in it. Well, you've just completely overcharged the system. You're going to be blowing free on out through the pop-off valve on the back of the compressor and I'm trying to explain why that happens and why it's so easy to overshoot and mess yourself up because remember pressure equals temperature let me try to get this where you can see it okay get rid of that glare glares everywhere hang on okay that's better no glare all right so because remember our, our refrigerant we have is R134A uh, remember pressure equals temperature ideally say you want to be around 30 35 psi our, our outer ring is, is psi so if you hit it if you get it set about 30 psi you come on into the blue ring because remember blue is our 134 if you hit the mark at 30 psi then the the temperature on that coil is going to be well, about 36 degrees that's going to be ideal it's going to be nice and cold now, if you shoot a little bit low, see when you get low on, on Freon, instead of having 30 PSI, we drop down to 25. Okay, now we've dropped down to 30 degrees. At that point, we're going to start accumulating ice on the evaporator. And then that's, that's just going to kill your air conditioner. It's going to, the airflow quits blowing, and, and maybe when you turn the air off, you have to let it run and melt all the ice off the evaporator. Or the compressor may stop. Remember, we've got that thermostat you know, right there. Its job is to turn the air conditioner off when it gets too cold. So that could happen to you when you're getting low on Freon. Of course, the danger part is, is overcharging, which, which is what I did. So and without a set of gauges, just using this can, it's really hard to know how much you're putting in and when, you're, when are you overcharged. So if you want to hit that sweet spot about 30 PSI, that's great. But if you pull a full can in, then maybe you only needed a couple ounces, but you shoot 12 ounces. Okay, well now you've cranked it up to maybe 40, 45 PSI. So in doing so, now you've taken the temperature of the coil 
it's like if you're at 45 psi now the coil temperature is now 50 degrees instead of being down here at 36 degrees ice cold air you're now blowing 50 degree air so pressure temperature goes hand in hand and it's critical to dial it in just right and it can be hard to do with just just a can like this unless you got the gauges i mean i think the very best way to do this stuff is just to you know re, uh, pull out all the freon uh, refrigerant and just start from scratch and you can see ours it tells you right on here exactly how much is going in so weigh it back in exactly 32 ounces and that should give you the best performance right there otherwise it's sort of a guessing game and that's kind of where i'm at right now i'm just sort of guessing because uh because I, I know i overcharged it in the past so in a future video i'm going to try to uh do, do that just just that you know pull out all the refrigerant start from scratch put that new put replace that switch that i need to replace on the back of the compressor and put in exactly 32 ounces to see how my performance does then see if i can't get a little bit better performance out of this thing all right, so I'm buttoning up a few things out here. I wanted to point something out to you. If you take the servo motor off to inspect it or test it, because uh, first of all, it just takes a uh, two quarter inch screws to take the cover off. But I want to point out to you, there are actually three screws that hold this on. Top, here on the side, nine o'clock, and then the one down at the bottom at six o'clock position. So there's three, that the other one's kind of hit on you. So you might not catch it and keep prying and break something off. So. You, you get, the, get those three screws out and it'll slide right off. And remember, put your heater control in uh, what, about three o'clock position. It'll be kind of a neutral position. It'll slide off real easy. And another thing, remember how the, this thing was kind of flexing and carrying on? Uh, I, as a test, I, I stuck this board in here and it kind of got it tightened up. I don't really like it, but it'll do for now. Just so I can do some work. Try to keep uh, that air from leaking out. And so when I'm going to go inside, I'm going to show you some leaks I got on the inside. But also I was thinking about, you know, how we got this. I was doing those temperature checks. I think this box was like 140 degrees. If it would do us any good to use like that peel and stick insulation we got here. If we cut pieces of it and position it around this box to, uh, and I dropped it. And but to keep that extreme heat off of this box, maybe that uh, is also affecting Because it's amazing. Because you can see by the, the coil here, I'm sitting at like 35 degrees, yet, you know, we're, we're not getting near what the lowest temperature I saw was 62. So, um, we're, you know, the, the, the coldness is getting absorbed very quickly. And maybe that's part of it here. But then maybe driving down the road will make a difference also. In fact, that, that just makes me, reminds me of something back six seven years ago when i put the um when i put the compressor in on this thing i do remember now the uh guy he you know he pulled a vacuum put in the 32 ounces and it wasn't cooling well and he thought he did something wrong so he pulled it out waited in put it back in again it still wasn't he said man i'm not getting the cold numbers i should be seeing so i told him i said let me drive it down the road and see what it does so i, I just took off down the road with it and there was it produced nice cold air so um that may be a big difference for us also. Okay, so now we're back inside. I'm going to try to tighten up some loose duct work I got underneath the dash. Let me show you here. Right off the bat, you can see the blower wheel. You see it down there rotating. You shouldn't see that. It's a big old gap right there. So that's one place we're losing a lot of air. Another spot is back in here. Look at that big gap. It's huge. Let me, let me show you how much air is coming out of that. Let me turn it on high. So you can see we got a truckload of air just blowing underneath the dashboard, not doing us any good at all. So I'm going to see about uh, sealing this off a little bit better. I did I did notice this gap was a lot better when I put that piece of wood up there momentarily because there was a big gap right here between this metal and, and the, the plastic to the outer, outer box. So that tightened up really good. So I'm going to maybe get me some uh, metal foil tape, tape this up, find me some kind of uh, good insulation that I can stick, stick down in there tight and fill up that gap. So let me dig around and see what I can come up with. All right, let me show you what I did. First of all, for this gap here, 
I had this closed cell insulation, really good dense stuff, real thick. So I tucked that down in there with a with a screwdriver. So all that's in there nice and good now. Got that sealed up good. And then for that huge gap I had back in here, you can see what I did. I just put me a big old bunch of GE silicone on there and uh, filled that gap up and I'll let it cure. Then tomorrow, I'll, this is the stuff I use. I, I buy this. I always keep a couple tubes of this stuff laying around. Get it at Walmart. In fact, you used to get it at Walmart for like three or four bucks. Now it's ten dollars, like everything else. So, but that is some really, really good stuff. I always keep a tube of that with with me in the RV. So now I'm gonna try to get me some foil tape and try to tighten up this seam around here a little bit. And then uh, after it cures tomorrow, I'll come back in here and kick the fan on wide open and see if I discover any more leaks. Okay, here's my foil tape work. Got that sealed up good. And like I was mentioning before, I may get me some more of this stuff. Like it's the stuff I used on my doghouse cover. It's, you know, it's got the sound deadening material in it and then two layers and the sticky stuff, reflective stuff. Really, really good. Uh, I thought, you know, if I put it on this, because remember, the only thing, the only thing that's separating us from 9,500 degrees, well, you remember I, was, I used a temperature gauge. That was like 140 degrees on the sheet metal, wasn't I? It's crazy hot. So either take this and stick it on the on the inside here or the on or on the outside yeah, in front of the firewall. You know, all this area here, all that sheet metal. And I did notice Winterbago put a little bit of sound deadening material right here. But all this going all the way across the front. All the way across the front, it's all just, just a little piece of sheet metal. So that might something might be something good to do in the future. Oh, I was gonna point out what this is. I noticed, like whenever I had the air conditioning on, I always felt cold air blowing out the top here. I thought, that don't do me no good. I don't want to cool off the windshield. I want it to blow on me. So I made these little things to, uh, to drop down in there and seals it up like so. That's what I do with those. Ta-da! Okay, so my experimentation is continuing. My next little test is I got to think about, you know, one time during this videos I've been making it's been going on for a couple of weeks I remember taking my little thermal gun and hitting this plastic and it was like over 140 degrees and to think about you know we got supposedly our coldest air is right inside this box from our evaporator but if this thin one eighth inch plastic one eighth I think it's what its thickness is that's all that's protecting us from 140 degree heat does that have an effect on our cooling I don't know but I got me some insulation R19 I'm just going to try to wrap around just as a test because I think remember my test about the best I see in split was maybe about a 20 degree split on average. So I'm going to wrap this up and then uh, we're going to have nice some 90 degree weather this weekend, maybe even up 94 and uh, see if I can detect a better split by insulating this box. So let's get to it. Okay, so welcome to another one of my little experiments. My thought process is uh, these, this uh, evaporator box, the plastic box, gets extremely hot. I mean like 147 degrees. The only thing that separates it from the heat is like one eighth plastic. So I got to thinking if that was insulated, can we actually detect a difference in cooling? Can we get a better split? So I'm going to start this up, let it get operating temperature. It's an 88 degree day here in Kentucky. I have to check the humidity. It's probably pretty high too. So I'm going I'm to let it run. Get measure our split while it's good and hot, and then I'll remove the insulation, and I can see if then I'll see if I can detect a difference to see if it, if the split gets gets worse. Or yeah, I would assume it would if the heat is a factor. So just a little experiment I'm going to do today. So let's get on it. Okay, so here's my setup. It's um, like 92 degrees here inside the RV. You can see my thermal couplers. I got two. One's going inside the vent right here. I got it poked in about four inches in there. And then down here, I've got it sitting just before the air intake. So it can measure the air going in. And we'll see what kind of split we get. Then once I remove the insulation, I'm going to see if I can note a measurable difference. Okay, you can see my engine temperature 185 degrees because I got a... Um, 880 degree thermostat in it. The best I've seen is a 22 degree split so far. We're at 21 right now. 
Now 66 degrees coming out of the vent. Got 87 degrees coming in at the footwell. So I guess I'm about ready to go out there and pull the insulation off to see if we can note any temperature difference at all. Hoping I can see a difference, but it is a really hot day. Let's try revving up the RPM, see what we if we get get a difference here. You see the RPMs there. Let's see. I had a phone call. Alright, here we go. Right, let's rev it up. What we got here. So there's a 22 degree split. And battery conked out. Turn back on. Let me get our RPMs up around 2000. About 22 degrees splits the best I can do with this current setup. Of course, another thing I know, you know, the clutch fan is not really kicking in. Uh, if we was going down the road, we might get some different results. All right, let's go out out front. Uh, let's select some temperatures. Okay, back in that firewall. Hey there, 169 degrees. Set the sidewall. This insulation is reading. 154 degrees. If that, if that insulation wasn't there, that plastic box would be over 150 degrees. And it's only one eighth plastic between that that and the our, our evaporator coil. And you see my pressures look pretty good based on this. I'm about 40 degrees on the coil. So it should be pretty cold air at least uh, leaving the evaporator. But coming out it's not so cold. Well, let's uh, pull this insulation off real quick and see if I can see a difference. And you can see how humid it is. Look at the water just pouring out. You can tell it's humid here in Kentucky. Hot day, hot day. Okay, I just pulled the insulation off, came in here. I mean, it's been not even five minutes. And you can see, uh, see our split has lowered. So now we've we're down to, looks like we're about, we lost about two degrees. I'm gonna let it run some more and see how, what it does. Yeah, you see now we're down to a 19 degree split. So, uh, so, so far we got a three degree difference. So there is a difference. See, and it keeps getting worse as it gets warmer. It's getting, I guess that heat's starting to get saturated on, on that plastic box. So now the output temperature is up to 70 degrees. We'll let it run some more. Okay, let me show you the temperature on the side of this box here. See that 100, 141, 143 degrees. 134. That box, that box is cranking hot. And remember the coil inside right now is at 40 degrees. So just in behind this thin plastic, there's a 40 degree evaporator coil. But you got all this tremendous heat load coming in on it also. Let's go back inside and, and see how it's doing. Okay, so now look, we're at uh, 71. 81 it was it was 71 and 90 when we when we first started this my vent temperature was coming out at 66 so i've lost five degrees at on, on vent temperature so it's it is making a difference so right now so we got 71 and 90 on our split okay one last test i guess let's rev up our rpms and see what we do
not really much difference. Yeah. I got a 20 degree split. But uh, we sure didn't take a big jump in the output temperature on that, didn't we? Interesting. So I guess the uh, next question is, is it worth insulating that box for a few degrees? Does that really make a whole lot of difference or not? I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to do a little more research on that. It might be. If I'm bored someday anyway, give me something to do. Oh, and I don't know if I pointed this out or not. I'm not on high. I'm on the next speed right here. That's my testing. That's what I've been doing my testing on this whole time. So... In case you're doing the same experiment that's the speed I'm running it at and of course I'm on max air okay so for my next trick I want to try to eliminate this play I got even though I've got all the screws tightened that comes from the factory it still has a little play so we'll go on to the other side and show you what I'm going to attempt to do and I just hope it works let's go see Okay, so here's our design problem. And so from the factory, oh, it's kind of dark in there. Let's turn on some light. Okay. So you can see from the factory, you got these screws here. So that's what we call that one o'clock position, three o'clock, all the way around on the back side on the bottom where you can't see so well. Back, back under here, there's a nine o'clock position somewhere. There it is, nine o'clock position. All right, so from nine o'clock to one o'clock, from 9 to 1, we have no screws, no support. Now, I've taken the blower, mo blower motor off. See my big hole there. And by doing so, I've been able to stick my hand up in there. And I can feel up where the, where the box, box ends. So my what I'm going to attempt to do is drill at least one hole here, maybe another one. Get the camera in the right spot. Here we go. Try to dr attempt to drill me a hole here, maybe over here. I don't have much room because this plastic only goes up in three quarters of an inch or so, so it's going to catch it kind of close. So I'm hoping I can drill through this metal. I got a little right angle gearbox adap adapter for my drill. Hopefully that'll work. And then I can put a bolt from the back side and draw it through get, before I put this tape on here. But that I wasn't happy with it because it was still kind of floppy loose. So that's what I'm going to do now. So let's get my drill bit out and see if I can get lucky with this. Okay, I'm try to show this with one hand. This is what I'm doing. So you got this. I got this little device on here on my drill. So that's how I'm doing this. So what I'm using, this little tool here is awesome. I've had this thing for over 30 years. Well, I've got this one when we first got married. And it is called a skew. There it is, a skew driver. And they still make these things. I remember. I'll put this to, in the link below the video. Because what a fabulous tool. I've had this thing for, like I said, over 30 years. I've used it time and time again for tight spots. Here comes with the, the handle here and all these different bits. All kinds of stuff. But just I just use it all the time getting in tight situations like this. And it has helped me numerous times. So I'm going to get back to drilling and hopefully this will work. Okay, so here's what I've done. So because it's so tight, so you have to drill this hole really close. If you went any higher... You're going to be too high because the, this plastic box s stops about here and it is so close from getting to the inside edge i've had to grind a flat spot onto my bolt for it to clear and i got this little half shaped washer to help distribute the load on the plastic box open this is going to work i, st I may have to st i still may have to grind some more off that washer so my next trick is try to get that installed because i gotta go into that hole down here yeah, yeah hole down there get my hand squirreled up in there to get to it so and hopefully not drop the bolt at the same time so let's try so as i thought attempt number one did not work so i have to grind some more off that washer so then i have to get it so when i'm hopefully when i'm done it's going to sit like this on the back side of that plastic and help distribute the load and keep things nice and snug and give you a better idea where i'm doing see down here so i'm putting my hand up through here in order to uh, get up to this back side. So let's try this one more time and see if we can't get this to work. 
Voila, peanut butter, y'all. I got it. Nice and snug now. And hopefully that will help keep me from losing that air because I always had a little gap right here. So I'll finish tightening the rest of these up. Pull that 2 before out of the way and now see how it acts. Okay, something else I'm doing that may... I just noticed. I say okay a lot, don't I? Um, let me correct that. But anyways, I'm adding these washers here to help spread out that load. Instead of just having a small nut, I'm going to put this large washer here, then put the nuts on. Help spread the load. Maybe get a better better seal on that also. I'll put one down there at middle ways. That's what I'm doing. And by the way, I did do a video on, on blower motor, getting longer life out of your blower motor some months ago, maybe last year. But uh, I show how to take it apart and, and oil the bearings. I even drilled a tiny little hole in this back bearing. So, because uh, these things are starting to fail after about 18, 20 years, the bearings go bad. And about 150 bucks, but mine was still good and I looped it up. So, heck, maybe I should get another 10 years out of it without spending 150 bucks. As long as you keep those bearings looped, they'll just keep going. And it's a good idea to take it out and clean the, the squirrel cage really good because sometimes you get crud in there and it slows down the airflow and hurts your performance. So, thought I'd point that out before I put it back together. So I wanted to point out, look how tight this gap is now. After I tighten those up, always before I had a, a gap here, if I didn't have some sort of support on the back side. But now it is good, good shape. Don't know why they didn't do that from the factory, but they saved a nickel. So, but we got it took care of now. Better than new. Well, I got my air leaks off fixed. Remember before, let me show you here, turn it on high. Before it was flopping all over the place. Got rid of all that air leak. So now it's coming out the vent where it's supposed to. So that's something you should check on yours. Make sure it's good and tight. It's all the way out through here too. Make sure all that's good and snug. Woohoo! I'm happy, I'm happy. That did it. Before even, even with all the screws tight, I, I could always push on this and I could hear a difference in the air. Now it's good and tight, and I got no more wiggle. I hear no difference pushing on it, so I don't have to resort to that goofy two before hanging on there trying to make things tighter. So that was a pretty good accomplishment tonight, something to do at 3 o'clock in the morning. All right, so now to the next project. I don't know where will I go from here. There's just no telling about me. So here's the stuff I've got off Amazon I'm going to use. If you can see, yeah, it's got some pretty decent thickness to it, but it's handy because it's just peel and stick. Peel that off, stick right to it, and I guess I could, could put on two layers, make it double thick. But I think that foil will help too, It'll go go a long way about reflecting that heat. So that might be a good little project next couple days. We'll get into that, and I'll put a link to it below the, the video of what this stuff is, the, the part number for it. All right, let's get started on this insulation project. I've got, got my first piece here. It's uh, three and a half by 54 inches long. So I'm gonna see if that won't, I'm gonna do a dry run. I'm not gonna, not gonna pull the sticky stuff off of it yet. Just do a dry run first, see how that looks. And then we'll, we'll get started. See if we can't make this a little more efficient. So here's my plan, my little experiment. So I've got this peel and stick stuff up here. Got the sticky stuff on one side, insulation, reflective tape or reflective stuff on the other. And I've already taken loose, like, the, the thermostat, the connector here. I've had a couple of screws I removed because I want to get a com good piece of insulation on here. And then I'll reattach this stuff some way. I ain't figured that part out yet. So I'm just getting started. Just kind of want to show you what the plan is and kind of see how it's going to how it's going to go. I'm just kind of trying to do it in sections to a peel and stick. So, I guess for this one, I'm going to start on the back side first at the very bottom. I got one long piece, like 50-something inches long, come all the way around. So there we go. That's what we're getting ready to do. So it's going pretty smooth. I started on the very bottom back side, coming up and around. And I'm just peeling off the paper off the back, exposing the sticky stuff. Then I just press it down. I'm sorry, it's a little dark in there, isn't it? 
Got some light on the subject here. There we go. We just come around the corner and press it down. Push it back to the firewall. And then press it down. Got this little hump to get over. So kind of all there is to it. Not so bad. Let me get two hands in there. So for my top half here, it's going to be a 17 by 9 inch. Let's cut that and see how that goes. So you get the idea of what I'm doing here. I'm just leaving a little bit by the inch or so exposed. So I can stick it up in there and get the seam good and tight. Then I'll start peeling away at the paper once I get it started. Hopefully this will work out pretty smooth. So you see that's working pretty smooth, getting started that way. And it looks like my seam has lined up pretty well. I've got a little, couple humps there from where those screws are. I'm going to put some foil tape on top of that to pull that down. So for my front piece, I just went with a 17 by 12 once I get it stuck on there good. So you see I got my tape, I just got to peel it all the rest of the way down, stick it good. Then I'll come here and trim around these notches and work on that. Okay, we're making production now with the bottom piece under here. If you can get under here with the camera. There it is, that nice bottom piece. Got it cut. Installed it from underneath. It was a 17 by 7 and a half on that one. I got in there. This one over here is a little bit weird. I had to take me a piece of paper, kind of cut it out. I kind of just stuck it in there and did a rough cut because it's kind of a tight spot. I did that so I get my shape. So I cut it out right here. So now I gotta stick that in place. And uh, just a few more little small pieces like this, and we can we'll be able to get this buttoned up and give it for go for a test run here in a little bit. So this part's a little bit tricky because now I got this triangle wedge, but I got my TXV valves really tight. So if I if I had that sticky stuff, if I had that wax paper pulled off, there's no way I could shove it back in there. So I've already put it pulled it in there. And I just, I just let this part be sticky, about the first inch. So now it, it's adhered. So now you can see my wax paper. All I gotta do is just pull down on it and expose the rest of the sticky like that. All right. Now all I got to do is press it in place. There's some good sticky stuff on top here. Nice insulated box. You know, we cut these. It turns out like we need like four of these wedges because it's the same type of wedge. You got you got two on each side. A little triangle wedge here, one here, then around the corner on the back side. So when you cut one, just do a mirror I image for the other side and it makes it go quicker. So here's gonna be a little bit of a strange cut I had to do. So I got, got my paper up here and kind of did a little outline with a, with an ink pen. So I'm going here and know how to cut it and make openings for my hoses to go through for the heater core. So I'm about to wrap up my insulation project of the evaporator. You see how it turned out? Go up top. Let's see if I can show you on the back side here. All along the front. I'll crawl at the bottom here in just a second. You see how I got it on the sides? Got it all tucked in nice and tight. Okay, let's go into the RV and I'll show you what I did under there. Okay, now you can see from underneath how we got it all insulated up there real good. Got that done. And that's how that and that's how you do that. Now for my next magic trick, I'm going to try to seal off this outside vent. This is our fresh air vent and it's controlled back your line off. 
There's this little vacuum actuated lever here that all it does is open or close. Now, I've noticed this in all modes. This is strange. Every heat mode we had, it don't matter if it's defrost, defrost, you know, roll out your feet, dash air, whatever. Every position on heat, this stays open. We do not have an option where we have heat on recirculate. So if it's 20 degrees outside, it's always sucking in outside air, trying to warm it up and have it come out your vent. So I'm going to redesign it. I'm going to do a couple things. First of all, I'm going to seal this off because I realized you can see this gas material is, is shot. And even though when I'm on max air, so the only time this closes is when you're on max air. So when you go max AC, it pulls a vacuum on it, it closes down. And I notice I can take a little piece of toilet paper, because I didn't I don't I don't smoke, so I don't have any cigarette smoke, but take a piece of toilet paper, hold it up here, and it would stay. It would just suck it right to it. So I knew that that gasket was wasn't sealing. If it's not sealing, then that's hurting my cooling because I'm sucking in hot humid air and this air in this area is extremely hot you can you can tell that by if you ever have it on vent mode just outside air fresh air and you stop at a stoplight and all that heat pours out from under the engine you'll tell the temperature difference just blows hot air straight on you so my goal is to cap this off and I have to redo do a modification on the vacuum so that's what I'm going to do I'm going to seal this off so that way I can get the most cold air possible and I think also it would help in the winter time because when we heat up it will um, be taking our cabin air and warming it up and recirculating cabin air instead of drawing in ice cold air and then trying to warm it up so uh, I, got, I got to oh, someone cut me oh, I got a little sample piece here somewhere so I cut me a little sample piece so I know what size to go with I'm just cut that I'm going to stick it up in there like that it's got that good sticky, st sticky stuff on there. I think that'll make for a really good seal for us. But I also have to modificate, do, do a modification on the vacuum line. Because remember, by default, that thing's always open. I have to pull a vacuum on it to get it to pull down. Because I want it to be in max air mode. I want it to recirculate all the time. So I have to, t I'm going to show you when I get back up here. I had, to, I had to tee into my main vacuum line. But a new vacuum hose... So this thing is always pulled down, opening up the, the max air vent. So we can just always be in recirculation mode. So let me crawl out and show you my vacuum line modification. So here's my original vacuum line that goes to the vacuum bulb down on the bottom that controls the fresh air vent. And you can see it's just about ready to fail. If you look closely at it, if I can focus here. It's getting real brittle. You see right there how it's getting kind of cracking and falling as real thin it is so it's just about ready to fail so check yours because uh, that's going to start being a problem of course as you go up because it's down there maybe exposed to the weather and stuff more but as you go up further it's it's in better shape so you could always you know just cut it up here tap into it with a regular vacuum line so what i've done at the moment with my experimentation i've just got it capped off so i don't have a vac so i don't have a vacuum leak just put a screw in it so and where i've teed into my vacuum line to always have a vacuum is i put it right here so i've teed into that so that way that door will always be closed it keeps me constantly in a recirculation mode that's where i want to be so i guess i will cut me this piece of insulation and get that stuck up in there and do some more experiments Okay, size wise, three and a quarter by 17 inch. So I'm fixing to make my cut. Okay, you see the final product here? All sealed off, I think, pretty good. So now we can do a little testing, see how it does. Okay, so test number, number one. You can see the door is closed. Now as soon as I start the engine, you'll see it open up. So I got the blower on, but you'll notice there's no air coming out at all because because I've sealed off the outdoor vent completely. So at this moment, it can't get air from any, any location until it starts up. So once I start the engine, the vacuum will pull and that door will open up. It's fired up. All right, so now we're in recirculation mode. So now, no matter what I do, 
no matter what setting I go. So if there's at the feet, I guess that's, there's by level. I got it on defrost. I go back to that outside vent. I go to AC. I go to AC max. So no matter what position I go to, that door is going to stay the same. Now I realize there's always a possibility. I don't think this is going to be an issue. Like I can understand in the car where you're, you need that outside air because of the humidity from your breath, you're going to fog up your windows in the winter time. But I think because we've got such a wide, large open RV, I've really had, had, had an issue driving with fogged up windows in the winter time because we still got the defrost aspect of it. Because remember when we go to defrost here, that also turns on the compressor. So the compressor is also drying the air as it's being blown through. So uh, so that should uh, that should take care of any issues I have if it just kind of starts fogging up. So uh, but let's we'll do a little more testing here and see see how it looks. Uh, well, you can see I got a 23 degree split right there. That's pretty good. I'm sitting at 23 because normally 19 or 20 is uh, is kind of average. So I've increased my split already. Uh, I'll know better when I get it on the road. I keep getting better now like at a 24 degree split. Getting better all the time, better all the time. In case I didn't clarify when I talk about split, because I'm measuring the temperature of the vent coming out, also the temperature of the air going in at the end of that sensor right there. So I can measure the difference between the two. Air coming in, air coming out. Well, today we're going to do a driving test. You see, I got my hoses coming up through the engine cover. So I'm driving down the road to see what kind of pressures we're running and more importantly, to see what kind of split we get. You know, because I've insulated the evaporator, hoping to get better performance. And see my test set up. I've got uh, a temperature sensor here. And I got one sensor here in this vent. And I got one right down there at the end and we're running in max air so at the moment you see we got 87 degrees coming in and 60 degrees coming out that's really a good split that's awesome so look by it down the road we'll see how it does and we'll do a little video of these gauges and rpms and see how it performs
So we're back from our little trip, sitting here idling in the driveway. There's our pressures. At 34, 34, 5 on the low side. And close to 250. I hear the fans running out front. And here's a split right here, right now idling. 54 to 86. Everything's looking good. I think I'm going to leave, leave it be at this, at this point in time. That's my plan. That was a test I just got here. It's been, been about five minutes since we stopped it. I mean, you can barely touch this plastic. It is so hot or this rubber piece. But this, you can touch all of it. Nice and cool. Now, before, this box, would I think with my temperature gun, was getting like 140, 150 degrees. It's not doing it no more. So, I like it. I like it. So, I guess I'll unhook my gauges and... Uh, do some more experiments. Also keep in mind with this experiment, I do not have, you can see, I do not have my heater hoses hooked up at all. So there's no heat whatsoever going in that box. And I'm working on a plan on that too, something easy to connect and disconnect. Well, it is now November and it's getting cold. And I've been inside editing this long video. I think I'm an hour and a half now. It's about, sorry it's so long, but just a lot of content. I think it'll do us all some good in the future. Uh, really pleased with how well this has worked out, but, uh, but I, you know, because I'm getting really cold dash air, better than I've ever had before. But I thought maybe I can do it a little step further. So I got to thinking about, you know, even though, you know, we, I'm, we're keeping the cold inside the box, still the heat from the engine, the heat from the radiator pack, all that stuff is still coming up. If I, you know, if I shoot this metal back here, it's still very hot, even though I'm keeping most of the cold in the box. So I thought, how could I create a divider, you know, right in here, you know, between this, you know, normally we have this large rubber flap that mounts here and comes down. But there's this big gap that lets all that heat come right up into this box. So I got to thinking about you know, just using some insulation instead of some sort of metal divider or something like because it would be very difficult to do the way it's all this hose and stuff is. With this insula insulation, I can tuck and poke it around a whole lot better. Uh, kind of got this idea uh, oh, a couple months ago. I had a uh, sto electric cook stove where the mice had got into it and peed all over it. And, and every time you turn a cook stove on, it had this horrible, stinky smell. So I took the stove completely apart, got rid of all the insulation, put in new insulation. And in that, I was doing some tests, you know, getting it really hot, taking a blowtorch to it, and realized you can't burn this stuff. It'll char, but it won't burn. Of course, I realized I got to take the paper off. So that's my next step right now. I'm going to pull this out, pull the paper off. Then tuck this back in here, kind of nice and neat, the, the way I want it to be. And there's a couple of things I want to do. I, one thing I didn't like, uh, let me see here. I noticed this. I don't like how this, this is my su suction line. Remember I put that um, insulation over it to try to get better performance. It is laying right on top of my transmission computer connectors. So I got to fix that. Uh, my plan is to try to take the oil oil fill tube, take these four bolts loose, lift it up, maybe take the pipe loose and run this pipe over top of that and get the weight of it up and over the computer. I want to do that too before I put all this back together and there's some uh, troubleshooting things I want to go over about the compressor. I realized they didn't show you where the fuse is and a couple other things. I'm going to go over that. So let me get this insulation the way I want it and I'll be right back. Alright, just so you can get an idea, here's how much insulation I got. Well, we'll put about two and a half feet. And I'm going to try to fill up this void here, create an area to block off all that heat. And I want to be able to tuck that insulation like some of it on, on this side, of the suction line, uh, some more of it on this side. Kind of wedge it in there good and snug. So let's get that done. So you see how I got it tucked in there? Pretty pleased with that. It goes all the way back to the back. Because I'm like a hose poking out through here for the heater core because you notice all this testing I've done we've had no hot water flowing through the heater core and that's going to be uh, probably next week's video hopefully I get it done I'm going to do a true heater core bypass so stay tuned for that one uh, so my, my next little trick now is I'm going to try to get this line on top of this oil filled tube I've already took the hose clamp loose back there in the back took these four screws loose and Let's see if it'll pull off. Oh, it came out quite easy. Surprising. All right, now I'm going to just get in there and stretch and try to see if this hose won't go underneath that suction line. I hope it will. See if I got enough slack and get the weight off those uh, computer fittings. 
So that turned out just like I was hoping it would. So we position the pipe under it. The suction line goes over top now. So this is something you want to check on yours. Make sure you can pull this rubber flat down here. Take a peek. Make sure you've not got nothing laying on top of those computer connectors because this is the TCU or TCM. This is for the Allison transmission five speed. If you got a six speed, this thing's going to be all half the size. Of course, the engine is computer is down below. But that worked out very well. I just got to put my little clamp on the back, back on there, and I'll have this part uh, finished up. And of course, your last step, put this clamp back on there. Oh, there we go. Get it back in the original position that was. There it is. Really I like those clamps. Amazing how well they hold. I figure it's been there for about 20 years now. And it came off pretty easy for me. Okay, I'm about to wrap this up, I promise. But before I put this rubber piece back up, I was looking here, looking at, at my work. I said, I'm all happy with this. But I am, in a future video, I'll probably come back in here and, and add this same type of insulation all to the back here. So it'll help cut, cut down with the heat getting into the cab and the road noise. And remember, I did point out to you, so you can hear that? It's kind of sound deadening material that Winnebago uh, did put in on the upper side. So it helps with road noise, but they didn't put anything here. So that how tin sound is over here, over here, you know, just below the desk area. All that stuff has nothing. So I think I'll take, I got, after buying that roll of this stuff on Amazon, I got a lot of it left over. So I'll take that. Maybe another another later later video. I'll go in here and show how I it's like that. Maybe like it's late here. Try to keep some more road noise down. Uh, but on top of that, I want to. I noticed in editing the video, I don't think I pointed out the fuse location when I was going over all the components. And then I didn't specifically show how to test or check the compressor. Say for instance, you know, you turn on the air and nothing works. First thing you want to do. Usually you can hear the compression when it kicks on. You know, or you can just look down at the pulley and see if the clutch is rotating. Uh, so uh, I want to show you how to do that. But before I get go back to the cab, I want to talk about the components, that, all that makes that happen. Because first of all, in case I didn't point out earlier in the video, this is the fuse. You can see right here in the box, there's the 10 fuse that controls the AC compressor. Then there's the AC compressor relay. And of course, there's the auxiliary fans, these big noisy things down here that kick on. If you have a later model, model, like I mentioned, you may not have these auxiliary fans, but it may be something you want to install if you, you want better performance of, from your AC. Uh, and remember, all, the, all these three relays are the same, so if you need to do some testing, you can swap out start relay, AC compressor relay, auxiliary fan relay. So, uh, all right, so let's go inside and look at the compressor itself and show you how we can test to make sure it has a good power and good ground. Okay, so just imagine you have this scenario. It's been all winter long. You go to start your RV up and you have no air conditioning. First of all, you want to make sure is your air conditioning clutch turning. So, of course, turn on the air, turn on the AC max. You should see these little rivets here start spinning. That front, front part of the clutch is going to engage with this part and it's all going to rotate as one. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, it could be numerous things, but the first thing we want to check is make sure we got a good power and good ground going to this compressor. And here's the little connector. I've already unplugged it. It just pushes in there and locks in, but it's kind of tight to get those two little connectors loose. Luckily, I got little skinny fingers. I was able to get in, push one off, get it sideways, and prize on the other. Uh, you may have to use, maybe if you've got big fat pudgy fingers like some of my friends do. Uh, <laughs> You may have to use a little screwdriver or something other to uh, to open that up to to get it off. So, and you can see it's keyed, so it only goes one way. All right, so now I'm gonna put my camera here in a mount, and then we'll show you. Uh, actually, the, the the one here that's on the right is your positive. Here's your ground. So we're gonna test for a good positive and a good ground. All right, so we're getting fancy now. So I'm, actually, yes, I got two hands. That's rare you see two hands at the same time for me. A little camera mount here. Got me a simple little test light. You should, everybody should carry one of these in your RV um, for things like this. All right, where'd my connector go? Okay, so first of all, you want to check for 12 volts here. Of course, I, oh, let me show you, I got a good ground. See, it's a good, good spot right there to get a good ground at it. At. So, 
Put that on there, good ground. Of course, you notice right now we got nothing. It's not lighting up, all right? And key on, now this, now this surprised me too. Um, let all the noise get done here for a second. That takes forever, okay. Key is on, air conditioner is the AC max. But you'll notice, well, come on if I can see. We still don't have no power until we start it up. So to do this test, you just can't have key on. You gotta start the engine. So start the engine. We know we got a good 12 volts. Now we also now we also need a test for a good ground because one doesn't do no good without the other. And so for me, I've got a good 12 volt source up here on my dashboard. So I'm going to attach my little ground part here to a good 12 volt source. It's my wire that feeds my um, cigarette lighter. So I'm going to jump onto it. Okay. So now I got a good 12 volt source on the, the alligator clip. Now whenever I touch ground, it lights up. So let's test this. And we have a good ground. Now evidently, this is always grounded regardless of key position on or off. Even key on stays the same. All right. So if you got a if you got 12 volts here and a ground there, then your compressor should come on. If it's not coming on, then you know the clutch is bad. Just get you a new compressor. Uh, actually, I, we replaced this one, oh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, somewhere in that range. But now let's talk about, say, for instance, you don't have 12 volts coming to this pin or you've lost ground. I'm assuming, let me think here, let's assume, let me, let's do a test now. Now I'm assuming if we have a relay bed or a fuse, we lose hot. But I don't know that for sure, so let me do a quick test. Let me confirm what I'm saying. All right, so to confirm what I was thinking, I went out front, pulled the 10 amp fuse. So I know the compressor is not going to come on. But now I just want to confirm that we lose, we do definitely lose 12 volt or do we lose ground? Because sometimes up, things operate off of ground, but I'm suspecting it's 12 volt, but I just want to confirm that. So first of all, because remember my alligator clip is still attached to my um, uh, cigarette lighter. So I got a good 12 volt source on the alligator clip. So let's see if we still have a good ground. Okay, so still got a good ground. All right, now we should lose hot. So I'm gonna take my little clip here. All right, take my alligator clip. Now I'm gonna go back to a good ground. Remember we don't get, remember it didn't really work till we started the engine. So I'm gonna start the engine again and we should not have 12 volts. Yeah, no power. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that we definitely, if you blow a flu, if you flues, if you blow a fuse, you will lose 12 volts on this pin. The ground will always stay grounded. I just want to confirm that so I didn't give you some wrong information. Never assume anything. It'll get you in trouble, won't it? All right, so now we've got that figured out. But let's say, for instance, you got a good ground, but you don't have positive. Well, first of all, we'll, we'll check the fuse, but think about all the other components that could be. First of all, while we're in this location, it could be your high-pressure switch. Because I've got mine bypassed. I mentioned that earlier because it leaked when I put a new compressor on it. So I wanted to get on the road. I bypassed it. So um, maybe in next year's, it would make for a good video. When I change this, I, I got got a new one in my shopping cart. When I get it, of course, when I change it, I'm going to lose all my refrigerant. Uh, but then I'll weigh it in exactly 32 ounces. I think it's, yeah, I think it's 32 ounces on these. Because um, at the moment, I really don't know what how much I have in the system because I've added, I've taken away. I know it's performing well. But I just don't know exactly how many ounces is in the system. But uh, that'd be a good experiment, maybe for next summer when it warms up again. So, so there's component one that could be bad. Let's go out front and see what else that could possibly cause our problem. Everything else we'd have to, t to test. Okay, like I said, first of all, you want to check your fuse. 
you know, you make sure your fuse is good. But other components, you know, it could be the air conditioning relay. You can always swap that. You can take the start relay, put it in a position of the air conditioning relay, see if the compressor comes on. Of course, if that doesn't work, it could be the low pressure switch, or it could be the fact you just have no refrigerant. So the low pressure switch is breaking the connection. Because remember, if you fall below 5 PSI, this loses, it breaks the connection, and you will not get any 12 volts to your air conditioner clutch. Then also, you got your little thermostat here. You know, its job is sensing, it may, if it sees the temperature falls below 32 degrees on the, on the evaporator coil, it is going to break the connection. So it gives a chance for all that ice to melt off. And then once it does, then the it'll allow the compressor to kick back on once the ice is, has gone away. So that could be at fault also. So a couple different components you'd have to troubleshoot to make sure uh, to find out why you're not getting 12 volts to the compressor. So hopefully you won't have to deal with that. But if you do, you have a, you have a fighting chance of knowing what components to go after. So I believe I've got everything put back together the way I want it. I'm happy with everything. Got nice cold air, got everything all zip tied back out of the way. A couple of last things I wanted to point out is, remember from the factory, this is the line that goes down that controls the, the vent door, the vacuum actuator that controls the vent door, which was open 99% of the time unless we was on max AC. Remember I converted it so it always stays which I guess you what you would call recirculation mode. So it's always in permanent recirculation mode. And by doing so, I had to cap this line off. And you can see what I did here. I took a little piece of vacuum line. Actually, I bought some vacuum line locally I didn't like. But I found this online. This is, and I'll put a link to it. This is silicone, and I think it's one-eighth. Uh, but it's got a really thick wall to it. And you need that when you, you know, in a hot environment like this. A hard vacuum could suck it down, suck it together. But because that wall is so thick, that won't happen. So in order to cap this line off, and remember how it was getting so brittle, it's just about ready to start leaking anyway. You see how it kind of starts to just erode, this hard plastic does. It just deteriorates over time. Uh, so I, I just cut that off, I slid a piece of that silicone line on it, and I wanted something to cap it off good, so I just got me a a roofing nail, a little short roofing nail, it's aluminum, solid piece, pushes up it pushes it up in there, makes a nice tight seal. You know, if you put a screw or something in there, the vacuum may follow the threads. So I just want to make sure I got a good tight seal. Because remember we don't want any vacuum leaks on these 8.1 engines because we risk uh running lean and getting detonation and burning holes and pistons and all that kind of stuff. So it's critical to make monitor your vacuum lines, make sure they're in good shape. And Another little tip for you, of course I labeled it what it is, what it was, and then I put me some sh clear shipping tape over top of it so it'll be protected. So if the weather gets on it, it's not going to mess up my magic marker tape I got on there. Oh uh, well, yeah, I was going to show you the that vacuum line, how I routed it. Let's go under here. Oh, okay. All right. You see how the line's tapped in there and all that is now sealed off. I got it running up and over. And I just kind of bundled it all together. Came across and dropped down and then teed in to the main vacuum line here that goes to the vacuum booster. I may show that earlier, but I wasn't for sure. But now that I got it all buttoned up the way I wanted, I just wanted to point that out to you again. Alrighty, I think this is finally over. Goodness gracious, it's been a long video. It's the longest one I've ever made. And if you made it to the end, let me know. You get a gold star. And uh, anyway, thanks. Thanks for watching. Have yourself a blessed day. I hope you learned something. I learned a lot. And I do have some nice cold air now. Hopefully you will too. Have a blessed day. See y'all. Bye.